wife at a training event. Uh, it may have been two or three years ago. Uh, it was awesome. We've been uh, part of that. Uh, uh, we meet roughly about once every uh, month or two and just connect with our lives. Proud father of five. Actually, he's got two uh, additional kids. Uh, he's a newlywed, so go easy on him, all right? Uh, he's a newlywed, so you have to go easy on this man. Um, missionary, uh, spent many years in Africa, and now he re- uh, resides in Foley, Alabama. And I'm try- I believe in God that he'll move to Pensacola one of these days. And, uh, but uh, he's an incredible, incredible, passionate advocate for men. Uh, you guys aren't easy to pastor. Hello? M- and men's pastors and men's ministries are not easy, Amen. And, uh, and Chris, uh, uh, he's got a, uh, a lot of um, data points to back that statement up. But how many of you know that uh, there is, there is uh, there's an incredible opportunity for us to continue to pour into one another, and that's what Chris does day in and day out. So will you give a warm jubilee welcome to Chris Tatum? Amen. Good morning, church. Morning, church. Isn't it great just to be with guys? We get energy from being together. We don't get that from women. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> we get it from being together as men, don't we? And I'm, I'm only here today because of a relationship with, with Tim, who I appreciate so, so much. And Pastor Len, uh, I'm under your authority today and honored to be here. And thank you for this honor. Um, and I, I just want to say a point. I, I'm, I'm in touch with about 75 churches and um, our whole mission is built on the idea of a team and a point man underneath a pastor helping to reach the men of their community, whether it's 25 men or 1,000 men. And I just want to really affirm you guys for, for this man right here. I've gotten a chance to know a lot of, we, in, our, in our ministry we call it point men. And, and I think this is one of the best men best point man that I know here on the whole Gulf Coast, and it's right here sitting right in in your church. I'm really blessed by that. So, Father God, we ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to come. Lord, it's no accident that, that I'm here, that my brothers are here today. We could be doing lots of other things, but you've called us here today to this moment right now. Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would come and invade us, you would come and spark us, you would come and move us, you would come and convict us, you would come and and challenge me in a way I've never been challenged before. We pray for revelation in our mind, we pray you would open up our ears to hear, our hearts to feel, our eyes to see what you see, to see what you see, to think what you think, to feel what you feel. We just declare you alone are good, you alone are great, You alone are mighty and awesome and holy and true. And we bow before you as men of God. You call us sons that you say you delight in us. And Father, we say we delight, we adore you and love your holy kingdom. So Father, I come and ask your spirit to move amongst us, Father, in a a powerful way. We can do nothing without you. So come. And all God's men said, amen, amen, amen. Amen. Got a handout here. I'm going to need some help with a handout. Maybe some guys can help me. If you guys would get those around, maybe take half. He takes half. Uh, And who needs a pen? Does anybody need a pen? Somebody help with pens here with us? Thank you very much. Anybody you can help? Thank you so much. And I'm going to engage you guys in some, uh, really a dialogue, a conversation if we can, about some things. Let that handout get around. So I'm going to ask him questions. I hope you give me some answers, some thoughts. It's just us. We can be honest and open, can't we? Okay. So let's, let's think for a minute about men in America today. What is the state of men in America today? What are some ideas, some words, some phrases that come to mind? Just speak them out. I'm going to write them down. Put a, word, put a word to that. Okay. 
Okay. The state of, of men in America today. What's some other words? What's that? Defeated. Busy. Dumb. And dumber. Distracted. Wimps. What else? Frustrated. What's that? I heard a word there. Emas emancipated or emasculated? I, I, I think emasculated. I'll put emancipated here. Forgive my chicken scratch here, but what else? What was that? Out of position. Sounds like a coach right there. What's that? Lying? Lying. Lying, sorry. Lying. Afraid. Anything else? Confused. We could go on and on, right? Empty. Alone. No, I'm going to play real. A little shorter to write. Broken. Okay. Yeah, it's been amazing uh, for the last several years just to ask this question in, in groups like this today and just get all these responses. And uh, they're all pretty much the same. Interestingly, though, nobody said one thing positive. Hmm. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, this is, this is men in America today, right? Angry. Violent. Addicted. Fatherless. Yeah. So, some, uh, some meat to that. Everybody does have a handout? Everybody has a pen? Okay. How many, how many kids tonight in America will go to bed without a biological father in the home? One third, about 35%, about 75 million children tonight going to bed. You can write that in, about one third kids in America today. For every 10 men in church today, pastor, this is going to sting. Every man in church today, church, big C church, all 10 are struggling to balance work and family. Nine of the 10 will have a child leave the faith or leave the church. Eight of the 10 struggling with their jobs to find them meaningful. Six of the 10 struggling financially, only paying the minimum on their credit card debts. Five of the 10 would admit to issues of pornography. Four of the ten end in divorce, affecting a million kids a year. But here's the kicker. One in ten will have a biblical worldview. Write that down. That means 90% of the guys that you and I are rubbing elbows with on a Sunday morning, they don't get it. They don't really understand. How do I apply scripture, biblical thinking, to marriage? Marketplace, career, family, sex, money, they really don't get that. How about prisons? You know, in America, we have more incarcerated people than any country in the face of the world. 85% of the men in prison say they had no relationship with what? Father. Our father's not important. How about fatherless kids? Five times more likely to live in poverty. Nine times more likely to drop out of school. Twenty times more likely to go to prison or to commit suicide. Now, if you don't catch one of these blanks, you just put your hand up and say which one you didn't get, okay? Okay. 
We'll catch up all along the way here, all right? Let me just say this, too. If you have a question or you want to interrupt me, feel free, okay? Can we do that? Can you nod your head? If I have a question or thought, I'm going to interrupt you, okay? I want you to know you have license to do it. Yes, sir. Need some more? There we go. Got more, too, if you need them. Thank you very much. Men in America today. Well, I didn't even answer that second blank. You guys might be wondering. What happened there? We say the war on men is greater now than at any time in human history. Would you agree with me? The war on men, the war on you and me every day is greater now than ever before in human history. Is this conference relevant, appropriate, vital? The concept of fight is absolutely, I think, the best word we could come up to reach men today, right? Thank you, Pastor Tim and Len, for leading us here. So what's the answer, brothers in Christ? What was the last command, not words, but command of Jesus? Go and make What's that? Disciples, disciples, disciples. There's no plan B, C, D. Only one plan. It's interesting, the master of the universe coming up with a plan to change the world, what did he do? Picks 12 ragtag guys, just like you and me, for three and a half years, gives his life away to those guys. He put all of his marbles in that basket, right? Amazing to think all the other things he could have done. He does that. Those 12 guys, 11, they catch it enough. They give their lives up for it. They change the world. We are sitting here today, right? Disciples, discipleship. So, what is a disciple? Tell me. Any ideas? I heard a word. Follower of Christ. Answers the call. Under authority. All great word. Discipline. Yeah, we, we see uh, uh, they're learners, students, under authority to a master. But I love somebody said it. In the word dis- disciple is the word discipline, right? In other words, a disciple will be disciplined. What is a disciple disciplined in? Give me some ideas. How is a disciple supposed to be disciplined? In other words, what are spiritual disciplines? Give me a couple. He's a student, a student of how is it, what are the practices or the habits? What's that? Okay. I'm going to put verse, flesh. Somebody said what? Prayer? What else? Consistent. That's more of an attitude. I'm looking for more of a habit. Fasting. Fasting. Obedience. Consistency. How about, how about communion? I mean, I'm, look, I'm thinking about the scriptures. What are disciplines in the scriptures we are given to be a disciple? How about, how about meditation? Or even the lost art? Memorization. Ooh. Ooh. He's going to be a giver. Right? All these are great. Let me put a little definition to it. This is what we use as a ministry. And our ministry is 33 years old. We have uh, 80 staff guys in 26 states based in Orlando. And we're privileged and honored to serve pastors and churches across America. I serve from Pensacola to Ocean Springs, Mississippi. I live in Foley. But here's a, here's a definition we use, and I'd like for you to write this down. One who is called to live in Christ, in Jesus, Called to live in Jesus, equipped to live like Jesus, sent to live for Jesus. 
You know, we try and get simple with these things, try and break it down. I'm going to talk really practical with you guys today, kind of nuts and bolts. Yes, sir. Called to live in, equipped to live like, sent to live for Jesus. Sound good? Just, just trying to be simple about it, get, get an idea. Hey, I'm a disciple. That's what it means. I'm called. I'm equipped. I'm sent. Right? Let me say it this way. I think, we think, discipleship is the greatest need in the world today. Do you agree with me? Disciples are the greatest need in the worldwide church today. And just because you go to church doesn't mean you are a disciple, right? Amen. You want to be a better husband? Become a better disciple. You want to be a better father? Become a better disciple. You want to be a greater leader, worshiper, giver, servant. You want to make a greater impact in this world. Become an obedient, loving, devoted disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get all of that as you serve him, as you look to him, right? You get all the rest. All those other things we're hoping for and looking for. Disciples are the greatest need in the world today. We found out there are two keys if a man will grow with God. Two, hands down, non-negotiable keys. One, will a man be regularly in touch, connecting to the word of God? And then secondly, is he regularly connecting to other brothers? If a man has both those keys in his life, he will grow with God. But if not, he goes backwards. And the culture, the tide of our days we live in to say the same or our status quo is to go backwards, right? So how about in your own life? Regularly connecting to the word, regularly connecting to other brothers. This is why times like this, this is why ministries and leaders like Tim are so absolutely vital to men in churches today. Hallelujah. Even more, brothers, can I say this, that this, we believe, is absolutely life and death. It is life and death. Do you know suicides are up 24% in the last 17 years? The largest demographic in that increase, white men, 20, 45 to 65 years old. Men are dying looking for something to live for. We're bored. I don't have any purpose. I'm tired of the rat race, tired of the to-do list. I'm bored by NASCAR. I'm, I'm, I'm done with watching golf on Sunday afternoons. I, I, what, what's there to live for? I think one last statistic I'll throw at you. This one I heard a, a month or two ago. Of the greatest 27 mass shooters, 26 of them had this in common. And you know what it is. No fathers. Or no fathering. My gosh, you as a dad, I just want to hear speak that word to you today. You are absolutely, beyond measure, valuable. Absolutely crucial to the life, the future, the legacy, the destiny of your family. You God's finger, it's pointing at us. After Eve made that mistake in the garden, he didn't go after Eve, do you notice? <laughs> Who did he pursue? Adam, where are you? Where are you? So, brothers, you were made with a God purpose. You might fill that in. You were made. You were made, crafted, and designed to fight. To fight. We're not like women. We are designed differently than women. He made us to fight. He's made you to fight. I'll never forget, I'm, I was the new kid in the middle of eighth grade. 
I had switched schools in the middle of eighth grade. That's a hard thing. I was a new kid in a new school. Didn't know anybody. First two days, I was at gym class, bell waiting for the bell to ring, all the kids lined up. I had my books in my hand. Little did I know it, it was my time to be called out by the school bully. I didn't know who he was. Everybody in the school knew who he was. The drug dealer named Wally Scalio. Doesn't that sound like a bully? So here I am, the new kid, a little bit threatening maybe to Wally. He comes up and knocks the books out of my hand. And before I know it, I'm in a battle. I'm in a battle, and there's a ring of people all around us. Ah, fight, fight! And I'm, I'm doing this deal, you know. I'm Muhammad Ali doing butterfly, you know. It's the, you know, and I'm ducking around and all this, and I'm, suddenly I'm fighting everything within me. I'm fighting. And he's trying to deck me out, prove a point to the new kid who is in charge. So I had this, and, and we had those days where we had, like, wire lockers. I don't know if you guys know what those are, but I, I, I did a wrestling move on Wally Scalio. I picked him up and got underneath him and put him on my back. People are cheering. I had no idea what was going on. And I'm banging Wally Scalio. I'm in my, banging, and it's a wire. He's starting to bleed. He's cutting. He's crying. I'm banging. And then I just, people are cheering. I just dropped him. Fell on the ground. People are growing crazy cheering for me. I go down to pick up my books. And he got back up. And I bent down to pick my books. He tried to cold cock me again as I bent down. And our gym teacher, ex-Marine Sergeant Mr. Milliman, he takes one look at Scallion and says, I've had enough of you, and knocks him out. Those are the days you could do stuff like that. Not today, but in those days, he knocked him out. He knocked him out. They sent us to the office. You know how they like to do They looked, one, took one look at the situation and told me to go. I went back, and I went into my math class, and I got a standing ovation in math class. The new kid... The new kid beat the bully. We're made to fight. Right, Tim? We are made to fight. You are made to fight. I am made with a God purpose to fight. But the prophet writes, you know, he has plans for us, plans for you. But even more than plans, he has a purpose. And you won't be happy. You won't be happy pursuing any other purpose than the purpose of God in your life. No other thing in your, in your you know, love bucket we, we tend to have. You know, what can I put in and, and feel that sense of love and acceptance and approval? You know, that new boat, the new bass boat, that's going to do it for me. That new jump up and pay, that new position, that new girl. We, and it's empty. There's holes. There's holes in that bucket. You know, only one thing is really going to make you happy. The old Swiss missionary, Albert Schweitzer, he said this. I've always remembered he said, the happiest people are those that have found where and how to serve. Well, where and how is my purpose in God's kingdom? Well, I can fight with the greatest energy and passion that I have within me. Amen? How many, uh, how many cruise shippers? I've been on a cruise ship. How many? Come on. You've got to admit it now. How many cruise shippers? Quite a few. You know, I've been on a couple of those. I recently got married. Tim, Tim blew my cover here. I'm still a newlywed. Next month will be an, an anniversary for us. Took my wife on a, thank you, took my wife on a cruise. And, you know, this, these cruises, it's like the ultimate in being served, isn't it? In all of life, in all of life, it is the ultimate, right? I mean, your, your most difficult decision every day is what, what, what dinner place are we going to choose tonight? You know, to go eat, right? That's it. Incredible. And so much of us in this Christian world think I'm still riding the cruise ship. It really is about the cruise ship. How am I to be served? How, how comfortable can I really be? Can I suggest to you, brothers, sons of God, but there's a different ship, and it is. It's a battleship. Brothers, it's time. 
it would be a shame today for you to leave from this day, this weekend, unchanged. I'm appealing to each of you. Come away with something this weekend, even today. I'm determined. I'm resolved to change. Something in my life. Maybe a couple of things in my life. And you know what this is? To fight is to take action. No more passivity. No more putting it off. I've got to take action in some things in my life. And Father, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that there would be a, a, a dedication, a resolve in some brothers here today. I'm, I'm determined to take action in my life. It might be in my studies, it might be in my marriage, it might be at the workplace, it might be in how I deal with finances, or it might deal with this pornography thing I can't get rid of. Father, I'm determined to come away with something I'm going to make a change in. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So the battleship. You know, the battleship, everybody has a place. Everybody knows they're, they're in a war. Everybody has, a, has a, an authority. They understand. And there's a unity because of the, the purpose, the place I have, and, and the battle and the war that's outside of us. But the truth is this. I have met the enemy, and it is I. Anybody with me? I have met the enemy, and it is I. I'm the one totally responsible for my life with God. Nobody else. I can't go in on pastor's coat. I, my wife can't. I, I'm, I'm responsible. I'm as close to Jesus as I really want to be. Is that true? I love this book. <laughs> I love this book by this Navy SEAL. It's called Extreme Ownership. Anybody seen that one? Extreme Ownership. Boy, I need some of that in my life. How about you? I need to own where I'm at. Maxwell says it this way. The first step in leadership is to, to define reality. I think Brother Alvin said it earlier. The reality is I, I better face myself. I better deal with the truth of my life. Any thoughts, questions? Remember, if you had one, you're going to ask it. Let me take a 20-second commercial. I have a table back here. I'd love for you to stop by. I'd love for you to share, for you to sign up and get some more information about our mission. We want to see a movement of men across Pensacola and the whole Gulf Coast. I'd love for you to join us in our mission. We have some books for sale. They're all ten dollars. Love to get get some copies in your hands. Um, yeah. So let's get practical a little bit about our enemy. Any football fans here? Yes, yes, yes. Are you like me and just waiting for the season? Right, right, right. Come on, come on. All this boring stuff we've got to deal with till the football season, come on. <laughs> you know, football coaches, I was, I was blessed to play college football, and, and football coaches, they, they, they prepare. How is the other team going to attack me? How are they going to attack me? Offenses, offensive coaches are thinking about it. Defensive coaches are thinking about it. I, I better know my, my opponent. Because if I don't know him very well, then I can certainly understand how he's going to attack me. And I'm going to be unprepared on that field. And it's going to be a bad day. Right? We need to know. We need to wake up about enemy. And I want to I mention four tactics today. Four tactics. I think some of them have already been mentioned. Four tactics of the enemy of our soul. Number one, I don't exist. I'm not really here, he whispers to us. There's no enemy. There's no war. Take it easy. Nothing to worry about. There's nothing big to live for. Relax. I don't really exist. 
Some of you older guys might remember a, a, a musician, prophet named Keith Green. Anybody remember that? Keith Green. Old fan. We're kind of dating ourselves, right? But uh, he had a wonderful song I always remembered. He says, nobody believes in me anymore. We better wake up. He is, he is totally looking to deceive you, to distract you, to disable you, to destroy you. That's his mission. That's what he's about in all of our lives. Not just some of us, each of us. Peter writes it this way. He is actively seeking, actively seeking whom he may devour. You feel him? You sense him? You hear him in your mind? You feel him day by day? He wants to crush you. Your marriage, he wants to take it down. Your kids, he wants to kill them. Where's brother that shared just a little bit ago? Tried to take him out with suicide, right? One, I don't exist. Two, scramble communication. <laughs> scramble communication. Brother Alvin talked about marriage earlier. Irvin, you know, if you, you put all the struggles of men in one pile, all the marriage struggles of men in one pile, all the other struggles don't even equal that one. Brothers, if you're married, if you're in that covenantal relationship, it's God's crucible for you. <laughs> it's his training ground, right? That's why a lot of guys don't want to go there, right? People are getting married older and older and older these days, you know that? They're afraid of that. Why? Because you face things in a wife you would not face outside of that marriage relationship, right? Yeah. So she is God's sanctifying tool in your life. And guess what? You are her sanctifying tool in her life. Isn't that the beauty of it all and the danger of it all? Ooh, man. Heck, I got in a fight just two days ago. I'm going to be real vulnerable here. Here I was coming down. We had a week's family trip. I was telling Tim up in northern Michigan, 43 degrees. Three days ago, I'm in northern Michigan. We're coming home. We got a 13-hour ride normally from Ohio. Guess what happened? It turned into 18 hours. I left Columbus, Ohio at 8 o'clock. This is two mornings ago. I got back home in Foley at 1.55 a.m. Holy mackerel. We sat in the middle of Kentucky for three and a half hours. We moved one mile in three and a half hours. Thousands and thousands of people from the middle of Kentucky. I think it was back all the way to Cincinnati because it was a big, big, big mess. That tends to do something to your attitude, right? So here we are. And along the way, you know, I'm driving. I drove 14 to the 18. She takes over a little bit just to give me a little break. And at one point... Here we're driving southerly, you know, all the, you know, and you're going to laugh at me here. We're driving southerly all the way from northern Michigan all the way to Alabama. And at one point, we're in a little small town, and she stops, and she had a, a fork in the road. Which way do I turn? Which direction do I turn? I laughed. That wasn't the right thing to do. That wasn't the right thing to do. I'm thinking, you don't know we're headed south. Right? You don't know we're headed south. We're going south for the last 15 hours. That's what I'm thinking. This is ridiculous. You don't know which way to go. That's what I'm thinking. I laughed. Guess what? It was bad news. Here's the thing. Here's this communication thing with a husband and wife. This is what I'm learning. Is we're about being right. They're about being loved. We're so interested in the content of being right. In other words, what direction am I turning? I defeated my question by the tone with which it came. In other words, we can mess up our message 
through the medium of our anger or our tone. We need to be much more concerned. If we're going to serve our wives about the tone, being loving, and giving up, being right. Anybody with me? Just, there it is. So one, I don't exist. Two, scramble communication. Three, propaganda. What are the lies we believe? Give me a couple lies. Couple lies. I lost those. Did I lose the thing? Oh, here it is. What's that? Okay. I can't do it. What things won't change for me? What's the value? What else? What's that? I'm the victim. That's a popular one. I'll never be good enough. What's that? Not me. It's them. <laughs> it, would, it would help us to consider some of the lies that we're dealing with often. And really reflect on that. Really get God's word on that. Really get God's heart on some of these things that really aren't true. Right? If we're going to get healthy, we need to deal with some of these things in our life. Right? Because the enemy, like a button in your soul, all I have to say is him. Is he, he, he can't do it. You can't do it. He pushes that button. You can't do it. You can't do it. You'll fail again. You're not big enough, strong enough, smart enough. You can't do it. Right? The buttons. The buttons. The lies. Brothers. And it really is here, isn't it? The battlefield of the mind. What I think. As a man thinks, so is he, right? I love what Martin Luther said about this. He says, I can't stop the birds from flying over my head. But I can stop them from resting there. I can't stop the thoughts flying over my head. But I can stop them from resting there. Someone else said, I, I can see my mind as a, as a hotel check-in desk. I give vacancy or no vacancy to a thought. Extreme ownership. I'm taking ownership of what I think. What I think, so key to our spiritual lives, right? Someone said, you know, watch your thoughts, for they become your actions. Watch your actions, for they become your habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. And watch your character, for therein lies your destiny. But it starts. Watch your thoughts. Watch your thoughts. So one, tactic, I don't exist. Two, tackles. Tactics, scramble communication. Three, propaganda. Four, intimidation. Here's another question. What makes us quit? What makes us quit? Yeah. Somebody said fear. Shame. What's that? Past. Okay. Fear, shame, past, lack of confidence, procrastination. The what? Okay. Comparison. What's in it? Is it worth it, right? How about just, yeah, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired. Well, somebody sign. 
Brothers, don't fear the enemy. He is not omnipotent. He is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. There's only one we should fear, and that's our loving creator who made us, right? Let me end with these thoughts. What's our time frame, Tim? 1230? 3.30? Lunch is waiting. I feel that, that bell beginning to ring. Let me suggest the last couple thoughts. Uh, so all this to say, we're made to fight. What do we fight for? Truth is, we fight the wrong things often. We fight our wives. We fight our kids. We fight our boss. We fight the government. I'm going to give you three things we, we should fight for. One, fight for your soul. That's the greatest thing, the greatest question, the greatest priority, the greatest key to your life that you would fight for the condition, the quality of your spiritual life, your soul. Amen? Amen. Second, fight for your legacy. The legacy that you're going to leave, your extended family, to fight for that. It will be all based in the condition of your soul, how you fight for the legacy of your family. And then third, we're to fight to rescue other men. I commission you, I charge you with a new vitality, a new sense of urgency. You can change somebody's life by taking them out for a cup of coffee. You, you know people nobody else knows. You can change their life by taking them out for a cup of coffee. You can change the trajectory of their marriage, their legacy, their destiny of their kids by taking a step that you know you've been meaning to take You know, you feel God's impetus to take. Take it. Take that guy you've known for years. You've worked with him next to you for years. You've never told him your story. You've never told him what's important to you. And you've never told him, hey, this is my testimony about Jesus Christ. Hey, can I share with you? I've never told you. I've never told you. Can I have five minutes? Would you give me, can I buy you lunch? Tell him your story. Tell him what really is the answer within you. You might even think of a man. Right now, there's a place you could write it right down there. I want to get practical with you guys. Somebody out there needs to hear your story. Tell them. Tell them. So, brothers, it's not the cruise ship. You've got to find a place on the battleship. But it's all about jumping on board discipleship. <laughs> The discipleship. The discipleship. I'd like to read something for you, and then we're going to read something together. You know, it's a, this month marks the 75th anniversary of D-Day. You guys know that uh, the night before they, they left on June 6, 1944, uh, Dwight Eisenhower had a, had a message. He spoke, all the men. We took that message and changed it a little bit. I want to speak this over you guys today. You know, it was called Overlord. You guys remember that? That was the name of the mission. We, we changed this a little bit. Operation Lord Over. You're about to embark on the great crusade of which God has been foreordaining these many years. The hearts of men are at stake. The prayers of God-fearing people everywhere march with you. In company with our kingdom allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, we will attempt to slow the advancement of the evil one's war machine, the reduction of unbiblical manhood over the oppressed men of America, and the ushering in of a great spiritual awakening, as God allows. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. This is the year 2019. Much ground has been gained by the enemy in the battle for men's souls. The world, flesh, and the devil have inflicted great defeats in open battle. Their offensive has seriously reduced our capacity to wage war. Our home fronts have been negatively impacted by the cultural invasions. The tide needs to be turned. We have full confidence in our commander-in-chief, who asks us to be strong and be of good courage. He desires for us to strive for the victory. Let us all beseech the favor of Almighty God, 
upon our great and noble undertaking until every church disciples every man. Amen and amen. One last thing, guys, and I'm, I'm going to be done. Um, if you turn over on the back of that sheet, I've written a declaration. I'd love for us to say it. Can we stand? You see what I'm saying on the back sheet? You got that? I am made to fight for God. Everybody with me? Come on, stand up, brothers. Stand up, brothers. Now, I want to hear a little bit of, uh, a little bit of energy, right? Warriors of God, a little bit of passion, a little bit of urgency. Here we go, say it with me. I declare that I am and all men are in a war, yet I am made with a God purpose and designed to fight for the things of God. I declare that I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. My only hope to be the best man I can be is to be that disciple whose hero is Jesus. I declare that as a husband and father, I am of immeasurable value and without doubt, totally key to the legacy and destiny of my family he has given me. I declare that I am resolved to find my place on the kingdom battleship and to wage war as his son and to fight well all my days with all my fighting brothers. I declare that I will defeat my enemy I will not listen to his lies, nor ever quit, but fight for my soul, the legacy of my family, and for the souls of men. I will overcome, because he did, and therefore I can. I am a warrior who fights with passion, and passion for God. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Bless you. Hallelujah. Hey, read that last part one more time, you guys. Come on, lift your voice. Say, I will overcome because he did, and therefore I can. Come on, somebody shout, I can because he did. Say it again. Say, I can because he did. I want you to close your eyes right now. I want you to grab a hold of a circumstance, a situation, something that you feel today you can't overcome. And then we're going to declare that one more time. Come on, whatever you wrote down in Irvin's session, whatever you talked about in, in the other breakouts, what is the one area that if you were to walk out today, you say, God, this is an area I need to overcome. Got a hold of it? Come on, grab a hold of it, whatever it may be. Come on, let's declare that one more time. Say, I will, I will overcome. overcome. And then you insert what you just said. You insert what you just grabbed. All right, let's say it again. I will, I will overcome, overcome because he did. Therefore, I can. Shout it. I am a warrior who fights. I am a warrior who fights. I am. A warrior who fights. There's something, about, uh, there's something about us tapping in to the spirit of a warrior, amen? A fighter. I've never fought in the military. I'm looking back there at Jason. I know he's fought many years. In the, I've never done that before. But I'm telling you, there's something about when we tap in to the spirit of a warrior. Martin, wherever you're at. Martin, race up here. I want you to pray over these men. To pray, to, to have the heart and to have the fight of a warrior. Hey, listen, I, and I'm not going to call you out, but I'm telling you, some of us have been way too wimpy weenie. Some of us have been way too passive, and I'm speaking to my, we've been, we've been willing just to kind of accept and take whatever the enemy, whatever comes, I'm telling you, there's something that I believe that if, if there's nothing else that we walk out of this room this morning knowing, is that I have the ability to fight. Where I thought I didn't, God is, God is empowering you. He's, he's downloading on you the ability to fight. Are you hearing me? That the ability to fight for your marriage, the ability to fight for your identity, the ability to fight for the purposes of God, the ability for you to be a winner. I don't have to have, I don't have to have uh, the loser over my life. 
Yeah, I may have walked through some situations. Yeah, I may have walked through some things I lost in, but that does not make me a win. That does not make me a loser. That makes me a winner in Christ because what we just read says, because he did, I can. Because he did, I can. I'm speaking to souls this morning. I'm waking them up. I'm waking, I'm speaking to the souls this morning that need to be awoken to God's purpose. I'm speaking to souls this morning that is willing just to go through life and just the case sirrah, sirrah. I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, God is speaking and downloading on the inside of men this morning to wake up, to learn how to dig your heels in, learn how to fight. I can because he did. You're teaching us, Holy Spirit. I can because you did. The ability to fight God is found in you, not in me. I can because you did. I can overcome. I can overcome because you did. So I can. Come on, all over this room. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, spirit of a fighter. Young men and old, spirit of a fighter, come on, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, let that spirit drop in this room to fight, not in the natural, to fight because you did, so I can. Come on, Martin, pray over these warriors this morning. Come on, I want you to tap into the God that's on the inside of you. You're now leading this, you're now leading an army of men. Martin, I want you to declare what, what God is speak, what God says to you, you speak it over us. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Lord God, thank you for these men that has come out, oh God. That's come to the battlefield. That has come and they, they took the step forward to face the challenges, to face the things in this life that 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 tempt them, that, that make them want to turn and run, Father God. I pray, oh God, that they would look at them as David did, as uncircumcised Philistines. Who is this challenging my Lord? Who is this calling out my God? Who is this? Who is What, what situation is this that is tempting me to, to challenge the God, the, the, the supreme being, oh God? I thank you, oh God, that we will overcome any and every situation. We'll overcome all the temptations, oh God. We will stand up and be the men in our family that you would call us to be, Father God. We'll be the prayer warriors that you would call us to be, Father God. God. We'll be the, the men of wise counsel that you have called us to be, oh God. We'll be the men of influence, oh God, that you have called us to be. We'll be the men that will seek you. We'll be men of prayer, oh God. And we'll be men of spiritual warfare. We just thank you, oh God, for the mighty things that you're going to do. Not just, not, not, not in the flesh, oh God, but in our spirit. Build us up. Equip us. Encourage us, oh God. <laughs> and let us do those things, oh God. Those things that we've seen others do, oh God. For we are, same, we are the same men. We got the same God. Do your mighty miracles, oh God. Work the wonders. Use us. Use us, oh God. Show us, oh God. And, and make us the believers, oh God. Let us, let us be the testimonies that others will talk about. And let that warrior, that warrior spirit, that warrior mentality rise up, oh God. And look at the situation. Not look at the person, but look at the situation and face it head on and not run. In Jesus' name, we declare and we believe it. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord this morning. Yes. Come on, well, let's give Chris a big hand for what he spoke into us. That was incredible. Hey, so the last thing uh, before we head to lunch, um, I want you to do something when we uh, head next door. One of the things that I grabbed a hold of that Chris was saying and and really reinforcing is that we need each other. We need each other. We need each other, you guys. So I want you to sit with somebody maybe you don't normally, maybe you don't even know them. I want you to find somebody when we walk over next door and there's, once again, there's a ton of food, so everyone is welcome. I want, don't, please don't leave. Homemade food. Um, but I want you to sit beside somebody you don't normally sit with. Find somebody you don't know. Find out about their life, who they are, and uh, I, I think that's going to, I'm praying as we 
exit this conference this week. It's going to spark a desire to want to pour and to want to lead and to want to uh, be accountable to one another and to really grow. Amen? Is that all right? So, Father, we just bless the food, God. Bless the hands and prepared it. We thank you for the incredible women next door, God, that have been working all morning long. And, and they actually, they were here last late till last night, God. Lord, we just thank you. Just bless their hands, God. Lord, bless our, our, our fellowship, God. And, Lord, we thank you. Let everything that we do the, uh, today, God, let it just um, lift you up and exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, so we'll break for lunch. We'll be back here tonight, 645, uh, for the uh, general session. You're not going to miss it. Pastor, Mar uh, Pastor um, Marvin's going to be preaching tonight, and it's going to be awesome. And he has a demonstration of not breaking boards. But it is going to be good. It's going to be good. Too soon? We're going to have an altar call for his wrist. <laughs>